Hello, welcome to today's installment of The Benefits of Being an Octopus by Ann Braden. We're picking up on page 215. Okay, Google, set a timer for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, starting now. Like how the cold air feels like nothing when you've just stood your ground and told off the whole debate club. And how even the most organized trailer with nice curtains and a nice lamp and an alphabetized DVD collection is worth nothing if I stand up. When's your mom going to be back? I ask. Fuchsia looks at the clock on the stove. Probably an hour? I don't know why. The woman who lives across the hall. Do you think she'd let me use her phone too? Fuchsia cocks an eyebrow at me. She will if you tell her how much you love her birds. Her birds? She's got like a hundred of them in there. Who do you need to call? I'm already halfway to the door. I'll be right back. As soon as I'm at the door to the neighbor lady's apartment, I hear the birds and it only gets louder once I get inside. The neighbor lady is a bit old and stooped and has a small parrot hopping around on her shoulder with about another two dozen birds in cages behind her squawking up a storm, probably all arguing that they should get shoulder privileges too. Just keep it short, she says over the racket of cheeps when I ask her if I can use her phone. I follow her into another room, one that has even more birds. Your birds seem really sweet, I say, or enthusiastic. The smell that hit me when she first opened the door into the apartment only gets stronger in the next room. I can't really place it. It's like damp newspapers, but more funky. I'm pretty sure it's the smell of too much bird. Still, the little parrot hopping around on the neighbor lady's shoulder and burrowing its beak into its feathers is pretty cute. The lady grabs the little yarn ball from a pile on the on a small table as she passes it and tosses it up to the bird who grabs it in its beak like a tiny dog with feathers. The neighbor lady stops at the old-fashioned kind of phone. Not only is it the big kind that isn't a cell phone, but it's got a loopy spiral cord that's connected to the wall. Thank you, I say over the chirps. I dial my mom's cell phone number. It's me, I say when she picks up. You better not be calling, to, calling asking for a ride. I'm not. Good, she says. She drops her voice, because Lenny is already suspicious about why I had to drive all the way up to Route 14 for groceries. The ground beef sale calmed him down, calmed him down a bit, but he's still acting funny. It's like he knows. I cover my other ear to try to block out the bird sounds. I can barely hear her. He doesn't know, I say. But I haven't told him yet that I would quit my job. He knows I haven't said that. I can tell. It's like he's watching me, waiting to strike. I know he's never hit me before, but where is he now? He went over to Slider's to help him move a couch. Did they take the car? No, Slider came by and picked him up, but I told you I'm not giving you a ride. I know he's going to check the mileage on the car as soon as he gets back, and I don't... Mom, I cut in. How much do you have saved up for rent? Well, I didn't pay Lenny the rent I owe him yet, but that's the other thing. He, I think he knows that, too. I told him I didn't have time to get to Walmart to cash this week's paycheck, but I've never been a good liar and I try to ignore the panic in her voice. Okay, so you have the money from this week's paycheck, I say. That's something. And I still have a little bit left from my tips from the week, but even then it all adds up, it all only adds up to $167. What if I was able to get someone to rent, an, to rent us an apartment for that much? There's no way, she scoffs. Rent for $167? Have you lost your mind? There'd be one catch, I say. What? That it's a garbage can, not an apartment? It might come with people already living in it. Who? I take a deep breath. Fuchsia, I say. And maybe her mom, if she wants to stay. My mom sucks in her breath. Oh, honey, you know what Crystal's like. Don't fool yourself into thinking she's changed. I know, Mom, I say, but you know what happened to Fuchsia, and if that's happening to Fuchsia, then what's happening to Crystal when no one else is around to see? She's quiet for a long time, and all I can hear is the muffled cries of the birds all around me. It might be messy, I finally say, but the only way we're going to have a chance is if we stick together. Chapter 25. It took all the convincing I had to get my mom to put Hector, Bryce, and Aurora in Lenny's car and drive over to Fuchsia's apartment. 
so she can see the place and talk to Crystal. As soon as I open the door for mom, she's at my ear whispering, if he gets home before we do, I just know he's going to call the cops and tell them I stole his car. She shifts Hector onto her other hip. And even if we do get back in time, he'll see the odometer. He'll know we went somewhere. What am I supposed to tell him? Blame it on me, I say. Tell him I was freaking out because my friend needed help and that it wouldn't have been right to ignore her. My mom shakes her head, as if that's going to be enough. Bryce and Aurora have been standing in the doorway looking nervous. They know who Fuchsia is, but she's never been that nice to them. It's not like she's been particularly mean either, but she just hasn't been around little kids much. Even the foster families where she stayed all had older kids, and it's like whenever little kids are around, she gets itchy. Which is one of the reasons why I just mentioned that maybe it could be good to have even more people around when she tells her mom. And why I haven't told her about my other idea yet. She's not necessarily going to be a fan. Fuchsia pokes her head out of the bedroom and I almost think she's about to slip back into it and pretend she never saw us. But then Jane Kitty zips out between her feet and leaps onto the windowsill. A kitty! Aurora exclaims, forgetting all about how nervous she felt. She makes a beeline for the windowsill with Bryce right behind her, and soon you can't even see Jane Kitty because of all the pets and kisses being heaped onto her. Aurora isn't like other little kids that would yank a cat's tail, but she is going to get right in its face and tell it how beautiful it is. I cross the room to where Fuchsia is watching her kitten get smothered in love. Aurora and Bryce will be really gentle, I say. Fuchsia nods, but she doesn't look convinced. Remind me again why your whole family had to come? My mom and I are just here to back you up when you tell your mom about Michael. And I take in Bryce and Aurora who are still wearing their big puffy winter coats and look like dirty Oompa Loompas. And they just have to go wherever we go. When Crystal shows up 20 minutes later, she's pretty surprised to find all of us here too. What the? She starts but stops when she sees the little kids. Come on, I whisper to Bryce and Aurora. How about you bring Jane Kitty to Fuchsia's bed in the other room and keep playing there? The magic of Jane Kitty means that they don't care where they are, as long as they get to keep petting her head and rolling balls of tinfoil at her belly for her to fend off like a spastic ninja. When I come back out to the main room, my mom and Crystal are staring at each other like they're in full on showdown in a full on showdown. I thought I told you I didn't need your pity, Crystal is saying. My mom crosses her arms. I'm not here because of some pity party for you. Yeah, you with your great boyfriend and great place to live. So what are you here for then? Because I don't need you to tell me you're better than me to know you think it. My mom leans back against the wall. I'm only here because Zoe asked me to come. Crystal's eyes find their way to me. I swallow. Um, Fuchsia has something she needs to tell you. Does she? Crystal drops her bag on the floor and comes around the table until she's inches away from Fuchsia. And you needed witnesses for it, eh? It's that good. Fuchsia glares at the floor. I don't have to tell you anything. Oh, tis Crystal. But what's the point of having an audience if you've got nothing to say? It seems like a real waste to- Stop talking to her like that, I blurt out. You don't know what she's been through. Crystal whips her head around. Oh, really? And I should listen to you because you're her mother and you know what's best? That's my daughter you're talking to, my mom says. Yeah, well, she's in my apartment, Crystal snaps back. Not for long, Fuchsia says. Her voice is so quiet compared to her mom's. Aren't we moving in with Michael this afternoon? Yeah, well, this is still our apartment until that happens, and I'm not about to leave, or to have. Michael threatened me with his gun, Fuchsia says. Her voice is still just as quiet, but it stops her mom cold. What did you just say? Crystal says. He fired it, too. Fuchsia says, not at me exactly, but not more than a foot away. Crystal's voice has gone hoarse. You're lying. I'm not. It's a lie and you're a liar, Crystal screams, and I'm not going to stand here and... You've been in Michael's car since Tuesday, Fuchsia says. There's no way you could have missed the fact that his passenger door window isn't there anymore. Crystal's face darkens. She opens her mouth, but no words come out. Instead, she just shakes her head. The silence that follows is so complete that I can make out the frantic chirps from the birds in the apartment across the hall. After a long, 
long minute, my mom speaks up. If Michael has done that to Fuchsia, then it's pretty easy to imagine the kind of stuff he'd do to you. And I say that, she quickly adds when Crystal's eyes widen, as someone who, she takes a deep breath, as someone who doesn't have a great boyfriend at all. Crystal sinks down into the chair, glares at my mom and then looks away. So things are in the pits for you and you want company, is that it? Crystal is like an unmovable rock. If the point of debate is to convince someone to see something in a new way, then it's time for us to bring it. What if you didn't have to move in with him, I say? Because you're going to find a way to magically lower the rent? And why are you here? Why are you even here? This isn't your business. I take a deep breath. I know five people who are looking for a place to live who could help out with the rent. Fuchsia cocks her head at me. What? But you guys have that great trailer and you can't be serious, Crystal says with a laugh. Seven people in a one bedroom apartment? I shrug. Seven people and not a single one of them is an abuser. Seven people and one of them once called me a slut. Crystal shoots back. I never said that. My mom jumps in. Crystal glares at my mom. That isn't what your boyfriend told me. My mom crosses her arms. Well, he told me you called me a slut and a whore. So was he telling the truth about that? Because I'm pretty sure he was just trying to destroy the only real friendship I had. That was a friendship? Mostly I think it was you telling me what I should and shouldn't do. And this doesn't seem all that different. When my mom just purses her lips without saying anything, Crystal stands up. You all have lost your minds. And I don't know what you're talking about with this abuser talk. I told Michael that we'd move in this afternoon and I'm not going back on that. Because you're scared of him, I say. You know that right now I'm shaking in my boots that I'm here, my mom says, and that Lenny will see the gas mileage when he gets back and know I took his car. My mom, my... Crystal looks at my mom, but she doesn't say anything. Finally, she looks away and mutters, I'm not scared of him, but I don't believe a word of it. You move in with Michael if you want. Fuchsia looks up at her mom from where she has tucked herself farther into the corner of the kitchen, but I'm not going anywhere, and they should be able to stay here with me. She kicks at one of Bryce's boots that he left near the door. Why not? I'll call the police on you, Crystal says. That's fine, Fuchsia shrugs. I'll have already called them about Michael. Zoe told me about protective orders, and I don't want that man allowed anywhere near me. You want them to take you back into foster care? Crystal hisses. Then they do, but they wouldn't have to. Not if you stayed here and called the police about Michael for me. Crystal squeezes her hands together, and I realize that they're shaking. My mom stands up and puts a scrap of paper on the table. That's the domestic violence hotline number. You should think about calling it, no matter what you decide about us. Crystal's only answer is to glare at my mom and keep squeezing her hands together. Zoe, come on, my mom says. I think it's time for us to go. She bangs on the bedroom door. Bryce, Aurora, she calls, let's go. She opens the door to reveal Bryce cupping Jane Kitty in his hands like the most precious jewel in the world. Aurora is wrapping Bryce's legs up in a bear hug like it's the only way to get out her need to squeeze something super tight with love. Oh, please, Bryce sobs. Don't make us leave yet. This kitten loves us, and we love her. His voice is trembling, and there are tears in his eyes. My mom pauses, and in that pause, I hear a voice. Crystal's voice. You can stay. You can all stay. She's looking at Bryce as she lets out a long breath. We'll make it work. Chapter 26. What do you mean, all our stuff? Bryce calls from the back seat. My mom doesn't take her eyes off the road. We need to pack it up, and quickly. You can't ask too many questions. Are we going to use this car, I ask? My mom shakes her head. Too risky, but Connor's already at the pizza pit for the lunch shift. I think he'd let us use his to get our stuff out of there. She grips the steering wheel hard, as long as Lenny isn't already back home. So, do you mean I have to pack up all my toys? Bryce asks. That's what she means, I say. And Petunia? Aurora asks. Where are Petunia going? I twist around in my seat. We're all going to be staying together and Petunia is going to stay with us. It's just that we're going to be living in a new place. Bryce has been scratching at the old sticker from school that's stuck to his shirt, but he stops and looks at me. Where? 
I suck in my breath. We're going to be living with Fuchsia and her mom in the apartment. With the kitty? Aurora shrieks. If she hadn't been buckled into her booster seat, I think she would have rocketed clear across the car. Yes, I say, with the kitty. But for the rest of the drive, all Bryce and Aurora can do is scream in excitement about the kitty. They only stop their shrieking when my mom pulls into the trailer park and slows down for each of our final turns. Okay, Google, stop. All right, we'll pick up there tomorrow.